Hey, how's it going? It's Grant and Shelby with the Garden of Eater. And tonight we're going to be talking all about water parameters for your shrimp tank, mainly Neocaridina and Caridina. If you have questions on other invertebrates or something like that, or some of the fish Shelby keeps, so the fish I might keep, but uh, we'd be more than happy to go over that. But for tonight's itinerary, however, we're going to cover Neocaridina first. And let's start it off with TDS or total dissolved solids. Basically what this measurement is, is a total calculation breakdown of all of the minerals that are in your water. These minerals can be all sorts of different things. Uh, the chemical makeup of it, it really varies depending on what your water parameters are out of your tap and stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, uh, if you have really low TDS as like 10 to like 190 uh, by some measurements, that is considered soft water. If your TDS is over 200, uh, that is considered to be hard water. Um, but total dissolved solids is a great way to measure your water and get a rough estimate of what else is going on. Uh, it won't tell you exactly how much of each breakdown is in there, but if you build the water yourself or you constantly check the parameters and the total dissolved solids is about the same on your tap water coming out, uh, then you know fairly that the rest of the parameters are going to be in check because it's really hard to mix those other minerals in a different way in order to get the same total dissolved solids. Uh, I know that might be a little bit confusing. I'm gonna go into the other breakdowns uh, of what we really measure in a shrimp tank, but for the most part, the TDS pen is like the only tool that I even use to check any of the water parameters. All the other testing with the drops, uh, the API drops, Sarah, Fluval, uh, there's a couple other uh, test kits that you can use, but those are the ones we have at the house. And Shelby does all the other testing. Uh, I'm not saying she doesn't grab the TDS pen and do that too. She does, but well, only I, that only, makes water. <laughs> I only do the total dissolved solid pen uh, just because I know what else is going in the water. And it's just a good safety harness to have. Uh, if you're just using tap water, you can get a cheap TDS pen on eBay. Uh, find one that calibrates. You can get calibration fluid. Usually you get a zero and then a high number. I believe like 333 or something around there uh, is like the good calibration fluids that you get. And you make sure that your TDS pen checks and reads those uh, readings correctly. And if not, you can turn a little screw in the TDS pen to adjust those and make it accurate again. Uh, we only uh, uh, calibrate the TDS pen about twice a year, so every six months, uh, and you'll be fine. Uh, Bulk Grease Supply has a great calibration fluid and a nice TDS pen for around $15. I mean, it's not a combo, but like the TDS pen, I believe, is like $15. Um, but you can get like cheap ones off of eBay for around five bucks that work just as good. Uh, you just got to make sure you do the work to calibrate them. Either or, you should calibrate them. You got something for me other than uh, Matt throwing out the super sticker? Much appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, you Matt. so much, Matt. It's a cute little black cat. The oh. Spirit of Halloween coming up. <laughs> uh, nothing right now other than Stephen P said TDS is my favorite, tells you all you need to know. <laughs> It um, does tell you all to need all you need to know as long as you pre-check and you know all the other parameters that break down into it because you can't just go and say, oh, 150 TDS, that water is perfect for my Caridina shrimp. Just because my total dissolved solids and my Caridina shrimp are 150 TDS, though, does not mean that your tap water is going to have zero KH like my tank does. So that's, that's what's important. However, with Neocaridina, for the most part, if you have a TDS above 150, you're going to have enough GH in the water uh, that you're going to have well malting and stuff like that. 
and then also you should have some cage in the water uh, i'm going to go over this more of course but the cage is going to help keep a uh, nice and stable neutralized ph in your aquarium uh, the only way that your gh may not be suitable if you have 150 total dissolved solids out of the tap would be if you have like a water softener then it is possible that you can still have that high of a total dissolved solid a very low gh and a really high kh um so now let me talk about gh gh just stands for general hardness for the most part in my understandings now i'm i'm not a chemist i never even took chemistry like i took marine biology it somehow suited me quite well but uh, I, I honestly wish going back, I could have done the chemistry uh, because really all water changes are is water chemistry and mixing up chemicals and different kind of minerals and stuff like that to get the perfect water chemistry for your aquariums. So I don't quite understand and know how to make the perfect makeup for the perfect GH mineral and stuff like that. However, I do know that for shrimp across the board gh is the actual measurement that they need and it is a definite that they need at least four in some cases it can go a little bit lower than that but generally speaking most breeders keep their shrimp at a gh of four or higher so for our caridina and um, sorry neocaridina shrimp outside or tap water comes out of a cage about seven to nine and that right there is going to be did i say cage i'm so sorry the gh comes out about seven to nine and that right there is more than enough for the uh shrimp to have uh enough minerals in the water that they can molt perfectly not have any issues not get stuck in a molt or have a failed molt or anything like that June says I have a 160 uh, TDS, but the GH and KH is very high. So you say your GH and KH is very high, but how are you testing your GH and KH? Are you using the test kit, uh, the test strips? Because the test strips test in parts per billion or parts per million instead of parts per thousand. Um, I believe it's parts per million. I can't remember what it actually is, but... Uh, it's a much higher reading than what you would actually be getting out of the API drops. What's going on? They can hear the pump? Yeah, they can hear the bubbles. We had to... All right, I'll just turn it off for the live stream. Yeah. Just give me one second. Right now, the um, pump that we usually use here is actually in our bedroom, and this is a older pump that we had. So that might be a reason why, and the settings might be a little off. Did you finish that, that answer? um the gh and kh being high oh <laughs> yeah so it, as long as you go with the api drops or, or or just the drops in general you'll get the gh of like the 5 to uh 20 that i'm speaking but you can still have like a gh of 13 at that tds and you, that's not really too high so uh how do you measure tds uh, that's the pen. You go on eBay, Amazon, bulk resupply, and you buy a TDS pen or total dissolved solids pen. Um, dang, I should have grabbed one just to show you. Really I'll quickly. get it in what, a minute. All right. Um, but it, it's very simple. It also checks temperature. It just takes too long. Uh, in order to check temperature, I'd much rather, rather just get one of the laser pointers. Um, but uh, for GH, though, I highly recommend using the API drops. You just mix the test kit and you put one drop into the mix. And if you shake it and the mix changes colors, then that is a GH of zero or one. If you have to put two drops in or three drops in, however many drops you put into the mix to make it change colors is what your GH is going to be. So you as long explain shaking it between yes. each drop. And another pro tip is when you go to clean out your test tubes, no matter what you're testing, you always wanna rinse your test tubes out with pure RO water. If you use tap water, there's going to be a little bit of residue that's left over in those containers and the tap water is not gonna completely get washed out. It's gonna be 
you know, leftover, the evaporation is going to happen, the water is going to leave, but there's still going to be leftover elements inside those test tubes that you really should be rinsing out with RO water so that way it gets them as clean as possible and then hang them upside down to dry. Um, we, we really uh, recommend rinsing them, though, thoroughly after every single test, if I didn't make that clear. I'm sorry for repeating myself. But um, when, when you get your, your GH, as long as it's above 5, that's generally the uh, measurement that we aim for. And uh, I, I find that 4 GH isn't really sufficient enough for us. Um, I also forgot to go back to total dissolved solids. We've been able to breed shrimp in as low as 70 total dissolved solids, but you really want to keep them a little bit higher than that. Uh, I recommend 150 or higher. Uh, you don't really want to go like past 500 if you can avoid it. But if your tap water comes out at 1,000 total dissolved solids, I wouldn't hesitate to try and throw some neocaridina in there to get them to breed off the tap water. Uh, you'd be surprised how hardy these guys really are. And for the most part, they're not going to have any issue with the harder water. It's going to be an issue with the super soft water. Anything for me? No, not right now. All right. Sorry. The next uh, measurement that's kind of important for neocaridinas, but it's not that really uh, big, much of a big deal. Uh, as long as there's three kh in the water <clears throat> and kh stands for carbonate hardness uh, this is really like a, a buildup of uh, makeup of different calciums uh, that are going to basically be affecting your water parameters inside the water column and this is going to affect your ph when it comes to neocaridina tanks uh, it will affect your ph for everything but with caridina tanks, you have a substrate that is buffering and keeping your pH stable. With neocaridina, you use an inert substrate for most people. You don't need to do the aqua soil, the shrimp soils, or anything like that. You can go to the store and get uh, some play sand from Home Depot, uh, Walmart, or an area like that. Uh, you can go to Tractor Supply and get the Black Diamond Blasting Sand. These are very cheap and effective neocaridina substrates. The black works really well because it's going to help keep the color on the neocaridina shrimp. Um, but this isn't going to affect your pH. So you need something that's going to keep your pH nice and stable. And what is going to do that in the neocaridina tanks is that KH. And with a KH of about three, that is going to be keeping your uh, pH as stable as possible. Basically, the way that I, I like to look at it is if you wanted to keep your pH high for like a Sulawese tank, you could use limestone, you can use uh, crushed coral, you can use argonite. All of those would help keep your pH around eight. And then uh, if you have any kind of cage in the water, it's basically just broken down calcium. And if you think about limestone, it's basically like a bunch of calcium made into a rock, right? So the cage is like floating calcium in your water that is going to be keeping your pH nice and stable. So it really is a must to have a little bit of cage in the water. And that's why we sell the GHKH minerals is for the stability of the pH. Other than that, the shrimp don't need the cage, the molt, they don't need it for their livelihood whatsoever. You very much could keep a, you know, low cage water, uh, with some gravel, I'm um, not sorry, uh, crushed coral or some limestone and something like that to keep your water stable if you didn't have any cage in your water. Uh, if your cage is one or two, you can still have some shifting where in the morning your pH might start off a little lower and by the end of the day you might get some climbing as the light uh, is continuing to be left on the aquariums. And then, of course, as the lights are turned off through the night, the pH is going to drop again. And just that little bit of shift in the pH is what is going to uh, affect your uh, shrimp survival rate and stuff like that. So you want to keep your parameters as stable as possible. And for neocaridinas with an inert substrate, keeping that pH at three is is really like the uh, the perfect minimum to have. 
uh, doesn't hurt to have a little bit higher. I just like to test my GH compared to my KH and make sure that my GH is higher than the KH. That way I know that there isn't a water softener going on. Even if your house doesn't have a water softener, it is possible that your water treatment center runs it through some type of water softener through the process plant before the water hits the uh, pipes to your tap water. Um, <clears throat> I roughly talked about pH, um, but pH in neocaridina really doesn't matter if it's low or high or neutral as long as it's stable. So if you wanted to keep neocaridina in a zero KH setting with the aqua soil and keep the pH low, even down to like a five, 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 the shrimp would be more than fine as long as that pH was stable. Uh, if the shrimp are, of course, in an eight pH and you want to drop them to 5.5, do an hour or two hour drip before you just plop and drop them into the aquarium. Um, but they are neocaridina. You would be surprised of, is it super bright tonight? You gonna... No, okay. not bright enough. Oh. I have the blue hair here. Okay. Um, so uh, you, you just want to make sure you're not going from super high parameters down to super low. Uh, the, the, the neocaridina are very hardy. They can take the widest range of parameters out there. They really can. Um, I've even heard stories of my buddy who kept his neocaridina shrimp in his saltwater aquarium with his clownfish and the anemones and stuff weren't eating them. So uh, they're definitely impressive in that right. Brandon asked, are there caridinas that like different TDS? I've heard the calcios like to have a little bit higher GH. Brandon, you're getting a little ahead of us. You're <laughs> going to have to wait until we talk about the caridina. We only got a few more topics on neocaridina. We can dive into that. But yes, there are. Um, and then I'll also talk about... <clears throat> Talk about why we keep the entire house at 150 total dissolved solids, even though there are some shrimp that might be doing a little bit better with altered parameters. Is, was there anything else? No. All right. So, like I mentioned, the, the pH on Neocaridina, it really doesn't matter. You just want to make sure you keep it consistent, and that is going to be the key with every kind of shrimp. Um, then the next thing is going to be temperature. Oh, you go ahead. J uh, Mimic said, so how is pH kept stable with caridina where you don't have KH? Is it the substrate? Yes, absolutely. And I'll, I'll be talking about that too. You guys are jumping ahead of me. <laughs> I got to talk about the neocaridina for the people that have neocaridina because everybody's got neos, right? Uh, and then I'll talk about caridina for the more advanced. <laughs> That was it. Okay. All right. <laughs> so the temperature for neocaridina is is really going to uh, alter the effect on breeding, growth rate, overall size, and stuff like that. Um, but overall, the temperature isn't going to affect the, uh, the actual health of the shrimp. Uh, we keep the shrimp outside where they're really exposed to the elements. They drop down in the winter to freezing temperatures where there might be an inch and a half of ice over the ponds like there was last year, uh, or they might get up to 93 degrees uh, temperature in some of our shallow black tubs where they're in full Florida sun. The temperatures hit 93 and the orange neocaridina could not care. They're gonna breed faster. They're gonna grow faster. Uh, overall, they do seem to get a little bit bigger in the warmer water. And then uh, the only downside, though, is it does shorten their life. Uh, the thing is, is though, keeping them outside, they get a little warm in the summer, get a little cold in the winter. So I, I hope that they're living an average, complete life outside. Thank you so much, Jeremiah Cox, with the one ninety nine super sticker and a thumbs up. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you very much, Jeremiah. Short little break for me. Um, but in the house, we keep the house at 70 to 72 degrees. Um, I, I've mentioned this in the past where our house was built before the heat index has risen to where it's at today. Uh, just lucky I don't do landscaping anymore. 
Um, but we do set the house to 70 degrees temperature um, on the hotter days in August, especially August being like one of the hottest months, if not the hottest month out of the year for us here in Florida. It can definitely climb up to 72, 74 degrees on the AC uh, thermostat. So uh, the water temperatures in the tanks don't tend to climb as much. The taller tanks will get a little bit warmer than the bottom tanks but the uh, the bottom tanks do honestly stay pretty much at 70 72 degrees um but with the neo caradina we have some in the garage the garage stays around uh 80 86 degrees in temperature and our green emeralds for the first time ever we have been able to keep them on the website for multiple months i don't know how long it's going and i'm gonna Fingers crossed that this this keeps running for us. Uh, the green jades aren't quite producing as nicely because they produce more coals. Um, but the emeralds have just taken off in, in those temperatures. Uh, I'm not really seeing like any adults die off or anything like that. Uh, so I do like the warmer temperatures. But the house we keep at the lower temperature, especially for the caradina, I'll go over that more. But there is less to worry about when you have the lower temps. There isn't going to be that chance where you accidentally bump the substrate and you get a bacteria infection. There is a chance, but it's a lot smaller when you have 70 degrees. So when we have plants inside and we do kind of tend to mess with a little bit of the plants in the substrate and our neo tanks, I will never do it in the caradina tanks, but uh, the neo tanks, it is a little bit easier. Um, to keep those temperatures low since they're all on the bottom tanks around the whole house. So I'm not too worried about them catching a bacterial infection because they're all pretty much at 70, 72 degree temperature all year round. And for that reason, uh, they have like a good long life. I would say three to five years uh, kept at those temperatures. If we kept them in the garage at 86 degrees all year round, they would probably only live for about two years. They would produce a lot more babies. Uh, the egg hatch rate at 80 degrees is going to be, you know, 28 days. Uh, at 72 degrees, you're going to have uh, around uh, a 30, 35 day hatch rate. And then, of course, if you get below 60 degrees, you can get up to like 45 days where the eggs take the hatch. So they definitely, oh man, I'm talking weird. They definitely breed a little bit better and faster, quicker for us during the warmer months of the year. And then, um, you know, worrying about the temperatures, you just have to be careful that the temperatures don't go from really high to really low too fast. If they do and you have a large body of water, that's not going to be that big of an issue. But if you're keeping them and breeding them in a five gallon bucket, this is the time of the year where you kind of want to watch on those nighttime temperatures. I am getting reports from some of my friends who, unfortunately, you know, they live up north. The temperatures right now during the day around 70, but at the night dropping down to 50. That's not a problem. But maybe one night it's going to go from 70 and you're going to get your first cold front and it's going to go to 32 pretty quickly. In a five-gallon bucket, you might see some issues where you get some die off. And with shrimp, if, you know, a third or a fourth of your population dies off, that ammonia is going to climb and you could have an entire crash where your entire colony is wiped out really quickly uh, when, you know, if you just move them into the garage, the garage is generally an area in the house where uh, the temperatures tend to, to not drop as fast. They're more stable. Thank you so much, Tube Dog, for the $5 super chat. It says, awesome. Glad to hear it. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you, Tube. And um, I know there was a question. Also, Tube, I've been meaning to message you about your, uh, right? It is Tube Dog, about the uh, 3D printer uh, stuff. Yeah, he want... asked. I already found him. Oh, well, feel free to email me, and uh, I'll give you some feedback. And then it was, there was a question. I lost it. Should I go back? You're good. All right. So to the temperatures, let's just keep those temperatures nice and stable. Keep them at 70, 72 degrees if you can. 
Uh, but don't worry about a heater in the aquarium. The heater is the number one thing uh, besides overfeeding that pretty much wipes out people's shrimp tanks altogether. Uh, the heaters can fail in one or two ways. One way they can fail and just overcook your tank and your water starts getting too hot too fast and your shrimp die. And then one dead shrimp, ammonia level is going to climb. The warmer the tank, the hotter the tank is, the lower uh, oxygen is going to be in the water because it'll uh, dissipate a lot faster in warmer water. Uh, so that's something to think about. And then also your, your heater could just fail when you're, you're relying on it in the winter time uh, because your basement is, you know, re, uh, down in the fifties or something like that. And your shrimp went from 80 degrees down to 50 really quickly. Well, they would have been just fine if they had just gone through the seasons and gone from 80 degrees in the summer to maybe seven degrees in the fall and then slowly but surely by the end of the winter they can drop down to 50 degrees no problem and then back up to 80. did you answer this question uh, i don't know i think you just kind of did it says our good our neo is good as long as it doesn't freeze over i was like spacing out yeah. reading things so so pretty much as long as your water doesn't turn into a solid ice cube the neocaridina should be all right um the other thing is you want to think about oxygen levels if you have a ton of shrimp and there's just a shallow body of water and a lot of ice, those oxygen levels are only going to sustain life for so long. So keeping an aerator or something to break the ice so that way oxygen has a way to replenish in the aquarium, uh, that, that is something to also keep in mind. So we good? Yeah. All right. Sorry. Then here comes the part that I really don't know about, and I love to just say neurite snails, you know, as when I'm talking about the, the nitrogen cycle, but ammonia, nitrate, and nitrate, nitrite, uh, all of these levels should be zero in a shrimp tank. With the shrimp bio load, it is so small that there really isn't a reason that even a halfly cycled filter shouldn't be able to keep your parameters as low as possible if you're overfeeding of course you're going to have these parameters off the charts but that is the reason why your shrimp are going to be dying not because you have high ammonia or high nitrite or high nitrate those could be also factors and are causing other things but those high levels are coming from somewhere and the 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 only real way for them to happen in a shrimp tank is from them being overfed or you having a lot of shrimp dying from the wrong parameters. Besides that, your ammonia levels should never climb that high. Your nitrite levels, your ammonia is going to be converted into nitrites, into nitrates through the cycle. And then you take out that a little bit that's left over with water changes and then hopefully the bacteria in your filter the plants uh, will help absorb the rest and keep those levels uh, as low as possible to the point where they're almost undetectable they'll never be completely zero but when you're talking about parts per million in those little test tubes believe it or not you can have zero um, the nitrites can actually burn the gills of the shrimp. So if you're dosing an aquarium and your ammonia is zero, but you still have high nits, you could possibly be having issues where your shrimp are starving for oxygen because their gills are being burned. The only way to get that out is to stop overfeeding and keep up and maintain your water changes. Uh, you can, you know, run uh, a tank with doing no water changes by over planting and stuff like that but uh you're going to be testing your water parameters and stuff like that a lot more than somebody that is just doing their uh you know basic routine maintenance and making sure that they're not overfeeding and stuff like that um so you know telling you perfect levels for all three of those is going to be zero and it is one of the easiest of all of the uh, things that I have ever had to do to maintain out of total dissolved solids, GH, KH, pH, temp, having zero across ammonia, nitrates, and nitrites is the easiest thing that we've been able to do in all of our aquariums. So 
Um, of course, the other thing that's going to help take out of those is algae. So if you have a little bit of algae issues, chances are you're also not staying up on top of your water changes or you're overfeeding or you have too much light on. We have the lights on for this tank pretty much on 16 hours a day. Uh, so that's not helping. And we just never got them out of that new tank cycle. There's nothing really in that tank to break down all that algae. So what are you talking about? just a little bit of algae on the front of the glass and stuff oh, like that. Yeah. So Mimic said, as far as Neos are concerned, what is the difference between what works for survival and what is best for optimum breeding? That's a loaded question. All right. So <laughs> it's a whole Crick Keeper has these charts that will be going onto our website. Um, but basically, if you go onto the website and you look at the shrimp, Neocaridina or Caridina, we pretty much use the same parameters for everything um, to keep it nice and simple. It doesn't matter what kind of Neocaridina we're keeping. They all get tap water. Um, but if I were to tell you like the perfect parameters, they're also on there. But uh, we don't mix the water to that. And we still seem to get you know, near perfect results by just using tap water. Tap water is also easier for us. Um, but uh, <clears throat> what works for survival is basically uh, the under the 70 TDS, under the 4GH. They can survive in those parameters, but they're not going to thrive. They're not going to breed. Uh, one of the things is the first week of the shrimp's life is the hardest part for them to get through if they can't molt the first time and their growth is exponentially faster in the beginning of their life till the end of their life so they're growing the most as babies and juveniles and that means they're shedding more as adults they might only shed once a month but as babies they can be shedding every other day every week so you need to make sure that everything is there for them all the parameters are there so that way they can molt or they're going to get stuck inside their own shell and basically get cramped and die. So um, optimum breeding uh, is, is when all those parameters match up and your baby survival is as high as it's possible. And, then, um, and, and those parameters might there. also Sorry. be slightly different for other people. I named off all of the elements and parameters that we actually test for as like a hobby. There is uh, phosphates and potassium and other things that you could possibly check for also that would be affecting maybe your pH and uh, uh, I'm sorry algae levels algae is what I was looking for um, <laughs> and so I really don't ever even think about testing those until I get into like I can't figure out why this algae is coming out until we found out it's maple leaf stone and just stopped using that. Never had that issue ever oh, again. Yeah. So that I was can't. high phosphates from the maple leaves. That was crazy. It's such a beautiful rock to don't fall for. It. It is gorgeous. We have yeah. a video on the YouTube channel. We still have it in we that need tank, to play but it keeps on, coming back. We need to go to the description. Crypt Keeper, if you're watching this, I know he's at work or sleeping because of work, but he does the reviews. Dude, we need to put a disclaimer on that video for the maple leaf stone. Like, don't use this if you don't oh, yeah. like algae. Well, I think now it's kind of like settled down. It's not like leaching as much as it was. Um, so maybe certain rocks might have, after so much time in a tank, stop leaching. You know, there might be some... Some it still, ha it still has do. algae issues. Yeah, but not for... as aggressive as no, it was. But it's still like, I can't get rid of it no matter how much... I, I keep adding into the tank. That's it true. just keeps coming back. Alberto said, tips for caridina attempts when your house is constantly 75 plus, sometimes peaking at 79, 80. That is high. So I'm going to talk about that when we get to caridina attempts for sure. I got you, Albert. Alberto. I'm sorry. Yeah, how dare you. <laughs> uh, right. Zen said, my TDS is 330. Is that bad? No, 330 is probably a really good TDS for uh, most Neocaridina. I mean, not most, all Neocaridina and probably most tiger shrimp. And says, so there's not really a too high for Neos up to, say, 500? No, so 500 would be even fine. 
we set up aquariums at the Florida State Fair every year. They do a little aquarium beautiful contest. Our water is 180 total dissolved solids here at home. The next county over is different. The fair is like three counties over or only two. I can't remember. But their total dissolved solids out the tap at the fair is 750. I don't know if they're using well water or where they're getting their water from, but it is high. And our water, our our water always comes home pregnant and happy. No, our shrimp always come home <laughs> nice water. and pregnant and, uh, you know, not having babies because they're only there for three weeks. But we send in juveniles to kind of give them a little smaller shrimp, a little bit of aspect and more depth of the scape to make it look bigger. And then, you know, they grow a little bit. But as juveniles, they end up being pregnant by the end of the three weeks at the fair. So... I wouldn't worry too much about the total dissolved solids, but I will say at the fair, we we do stay around a little bit longer and make sure that we slowly acclimate our shrimp so that way uh, they're not just plopped and dropped and shocked and going, why is this liquid rock crushing me? <laughs> like, I don't know if that's how they feel, but it's I wish I could talk Not shrimp. pleasant, probably. <laughs> All right, so, <clears throat> so I, I kind of figured the problem is I don't know if I'm pronouncing Syracuse right. Syracuse, New York. Sarah, I can't even pronounce it, so I'm still probably Isn't mispronouncing. It Syracotics? No, okay, so they're, it's supposed to be said like Syracuse, New York. So that's the same. So if I'm saying it right, it would be Syracotics. So okay. <laughs> hopefully I'm pronouncing Syracuse right. But anyway, it says, hey, I finally got 25 pounds of Rio Escuro Extra Fine, and the moisture is good. So now I've got everything to set up my first Caradina tank. I can do two five and a half gallons or 120 liter. I or 120 we... long. I would honestly do 120 <laughs> long. It's a because... liter, didn't I? I'm sorry. I mean, it might be liters, but I, I'm going to say it's a 20 long, and uh, I would go bigger. And the reason why is because at 5.5 gallons, you're going to have a little bit slower growth weight, growth rate. You're going to have a little bit, uh, you know, smaller shrimp of overall size altogether. Uh, and it's a little bit harder to keep those parameters nice and stable and stuff like that. So I would definitely recommend uh, going through and getting a, uh, I forgot what I was talking about now because you brought that up way too fast. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm talking about the substrate. Oh, getting a 20 long. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. See, I needed that, Shelby. Yeah. I was listening this time. Thank you so much, Lady Diane. Welcome to the team. Uh, I think we have your address, right? You can send out. I think this is a RIA on her membership. She's yeah. she's had to have been a member. Before. Yes, before already. So. Well, we need new stickers, so those will be coming out soon, too. Not new very stickers, soon. I don't know about new stickers for members, but the Keystone Clash is coming around the corner, and we will be getting, mm -hmm. yes. get yeah, two weeks away. Fast. Oh, oh, we do know. need stickers. <laughs> we need stickers for the Clash. We're struggling. But we'll be getting the, the prints for the members who have been supporting us uh, for over 12 months now, so those will be at the Clash. I said third time. I have no idea why. Well, welcome back. <laughs> All right. Dr. Anthony is here. And uh, he's counting how many screw-ups I have. So I hope you got enough fingers and uh, toes it. left. But um, <laughs> It's been quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm stumbling. I, it, we've been doing a lot this week. But uh, I can't find any of the good... Uh, self and mollies for you at any of our spots i have to go out to that one brackish spot on the river and mark has been you know very disappointing on providing anything that he says is like way better than our self and mollies so i'm just gonna get you some of the, the the actual nice ones that are legit and out there and send them your way um i was fully expecting to take mo around and go collecting in several different spots and have him photography a bunch of our uh catches and stuff like that that we went around and i was definitely going to keep some of the Lap lapatina for you i don't i probably butchered that and count that one too um <laughs> Basilia, did i get that one right i don't know uh, <laughs> uh yeah I didn't get that one. so 
Uh, and if you just bear with me, I, I'll definitely get you those. Uh, I wish you were going to the Clash. That would make it easy. I would just give them to you there. But I understand the uh, the back must be excruciating and pain. If you're going to leave Peru early during the dry season, I get it. It's hurting. All right. Now, the time you've all been waiting for, the Caradina parameters. And I will cover these extensively. Sorry. Okay. Cool. We're behind on uh, comments because I can't keep up. Aaron asks, I'd love to know your parameters for your Aurora Tangs. I'm kind of using the same parameters that I use for Tigers. Well, for Aurora Ties, we pretty much use the parameters that I'm going to go for and over with our Caradina. Um, so with Caradina Shrimp, we talk about... Total dissolved solids for Neos. It makes sense. Let's keep it the same exact order. So for Caradina, we keep our total dissolved solids in all of our tanks at 150. There are breeders in Asia who swear that 110, I've even heard it go as low as 90. There are minerals out there that you can mix up where the GH or general hardness does mix up to where you can get four or five GH and still have that low of total dissolved solids. Not all mineral makeup is the, going to be the same. You're gonna have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and different ratios to make up each and every different salt. And therefore, um, you know, different different breeders get different results. Um, the RO water and stuff like that, I, I think I got off topic where with the Neocaridina, but those are just the water parameters that we test. Oh, that was what it was, the maple leaf rock. There's all sorts of different minerals and uh, different content that makes up your water that's in there. And if you simply ask your water treatment plant for a list of different makeup of the elements in your water column, you'll see there's a bunch of things that you probably can't even pronounce or never even heard of. And we don't test those in the aquarium hobby. We don't know how those affect individual shrimp, individual spawns and stuff like that. So knowing that you're starting with RO water and just adding exactly what kind of minerals that a chemist has gone in and said, this is exactly what the shrimp need, nothing else, and there's nothing else in there to alter the shrimp. It is a good benefit of mixing your own salts and using the exact same salts over and over again to keep that consistency. With the total dissolved solids for us at 150, uh, this is what a lot of the average uh, European and American breeders will be using. Uh, there are some Europeans that will use 220 to 280 total dissolved solids. Um, there are some, like we talked about before, who will keep this at 110, this at 150 to 160, this at a 220, and this at 280. Um, and then the experience vary depending on one breeder or another. This breeder might have success at 110 total dissolved solids for their Super Princess Bees, and that might drop our uh, baby survival rate down by 50%, where at 150, they're breeding, they're producing, they're just like not mass producing at where we would want them to be. So I'm not saying that altering the total dissolved solids or the GH is going to be the answer. Maybe there's something else that's in play, like the getting the absolute lowest pH possible or something else that needs to happen to get those numbers going up a little bit higher. But when talking about total dissolved solids, pretty much everything in the house besides those and the uh, super crystals are breeding for us. Um, the the Bobalti are a little iffy also but besides those three kinds of shrimp everything produces and breeds well enough for us at 150 total dissolved solids that i don't really have to alter the parameters very much now that being said this weekend we traded some shrimp with alan is alan in the chat tonight hello alan if you are if you're watching but um we traded him some shadow pandas and some orange eyed yellow king kongs and some black calcios and we got some red calcios and some uh super crystal reds off of alan alan keeps his total dissolved solids at 220 so i'm hoping that 
Um, being as close as we are with Alan, the shrimp didn't go through too much shipping stress or anything like that. I was able to get them into our aquariums pretty quickly with relatively no stress. So I'm really hoping that the shrimp will adapt and do well and breed similar to the rest of our shrimp at 150. But if they don't, I will be adjusting the water parameters up to 220 for both of those shrimp to get them to breed. Our red calcios are just kind of like crawling on their breeding right now. But my black cows, our black calcios breed just fine in multiple tanks from multiple multiple different breeders or lines. So it makes no sense to me why the black calcios are fine at 150, but the reds are just like, yeah. I think it's because when I first saw red calcios, I was like, those things are so ugly and so like pointless in the Caradina world that there'll be like a three to five dollar shrimp by the end of the year. And jokes on me because they're still twenty three dollars or whatever on average a piece today. So. Really cool shrimp. Yeah, not a favorite. I know the Bloomfields are going. You know, it's so they're funny. beautiful because it's like their favorite shrimp, and I, they've got the history and background to it. But like when I first saw those, I was like, "Why is this the new thing? Like we are going backwards in our that's shrimp." How I feel about your safari line. Uh, so many people absolutely love the safaris, and I just think they're just. To to me though, the safaris are a double pigment. Great. They're not translucent. They actually have structured pattern. The calcios are translucent. Their they color is like color. a neocaridina coal is what they look like to me. <laughs> I love those. I wish neocaridina so coals looked like fancy red tigers. <laughs> For the Five Vibes can let us talk and he knows we'll chat. come back and show him the love. All right. <laughs> so did someone we'll try to get say out of this, clash. trying to say calcios compare to They're fancy cool. red tigers. I would say that my tangerine tigers that are just black and earth my raccoon tigers that are just black and clear are cooler than the safaris to me. I if safaris were one, blue and white, like that's, I would absolutely be head over heels for those things. I think, though, because of the all the wild brain. collecting we've been doing, I have a new found respect for wild types. So, yeah, I'm going to agree. The raccoons are definitely prettier than me. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Vibes. <laughs> Thank I can't vibe. wait for the clash. Is either. Vibe going Exciting. to the clash? Yeah. Oh, I always see Vibe at all the shows, and then it's like really upsetting though when we don't see him at one of the shows. <laughs> and local Florida shows. Maybe you're gonna be at Daytona, but like, it's always upsetting when I don't see a Coral Springs man. Jeremiah, welcome to the team. Uh, we will. You can. Did you sorry, just I get can't. a membership on a different account? I think so. I think that's the only way he could have Is done Is that it. how much support you're trying to show us right now? No. <laughs> he asked how to become one because it didn't have, he didn't have a little shrimp next to it, to the name. So did and you it, start a whole new account or did you just customize your account just now? Or is this a whole different Jeremiah? Or is this somebody no, this not Jeremiah? Okay, okay. I never read chat and I can't really see names too much, but that I might think be. the icon is the same. <laughs> I'm really good at identifying icons. <laughs> But not to mess. say that I know what's going on in the icon. I just kind of know what the actual icon kind of looks like from afar. <laughs> so I know you. who people are by their icon. <laughs> so if you go to a show, walk up, show me your icon. Be like, what's up? Could you imagine that's how people go to shows? That's how people need to. I'm sorry, but if you've that's introduced cool. yourself to me and I've stared at you like a deer in the headlights, <laughs> a thousand percent you walked away and the first thing I did was looked you up to try and find your icon. <laughs> so that way I'm like, I know exactly who this person is now. Oh man. I'm horrible with names. I'm sorry. Me too. It's, it's a curse. All right, so Caradina. Parameters, total dissolved solids. It is a, just a rough you know, guesstimate on where where everyone should be 120 to 180 anywhere in between there generally people have success but what i like to do is look at the parameters of the person that is keeping the shrimp before you neocaridinas i don't really care too much about it they either survive in my water or they survive in my water i don't give them any other option with caridina though i i pretty much the same thing but um, if I only had say five or six aquariums, I probably would cater to the shrimp breeders parameters at first and then slowly rise them up to our 
uh, average parameters that we keep in the entire house. The reason why we keep everything at 150 is because it's right at that middle ground. So if somebody were to buy shrimp off of us and they want to keep their shrimp at 110 or they want to keep their shrimp at 220, the time of acclimation or drip acclimation or however you're going to work that for them to adjust is going to be a lot simpler. Or there's a good chance that they're just already keeping them at 150 and the transition is even lower than that. Basically, it's parameters of very minute adjustments and then temperature. And as long as those the temperature matches up, you're, you're going to be fine uh, just letting that you know come down uh, gradually and not rush it too fast. Dr. Anthony, we definitely have some uh, flag fish for you, too. He wants flag fish. I've kind of like grown attached to the flag fish that we have because they're the same flag fish that we caught with Dr. Anthony. That's how long we've had them for. You want ones. your flag fish back? It makes you an Indian giver. We have several in the 55 and i have so many in the 10 gallon tank can you put now. them to work there's some algae I don't in that them. flyers tank i would like it taken care of and also the uh the the shiners have a little of that algae and i don't want to dose the tank because the shiners are nope. so nice tube dog said my first caradina will be shadow pandas or should i go with yellow king kongs i like the shadow pandas I would say go shadow panda, but the yellow King Kongs are like one of those things where they're really hardy. I also don't recommend them as like, Hey, you should go out and get these shrimp first because my yellow King Kongs will breed in a Neo Caradina tank with zero stone, which is adjusting the pH of the aquarium. And I'm still getting babies out of them. So they're really not a good, assessment on whether or not you're doing well with your caradina tank or not because it, it could be just a neo caradina tank in disguise and the you know king kongs are still having a good time um so shadow pandas are great uh if you are looking for something a little bit easier you can get crystal shrimp add shadow pandas to that later they can cross breed you can take out the crystal shrimps later and it's not going to affect your uh genetics whatsoever they're able to crossbreed and keep them together indefinitely until you want to separate them and you'll be able to tell one another apart honestly if you have the tank cycled properly and the parameters spot on the shadow pandas are way prettier than yellow king kongs they hold their price in the long run and they are a much better looking shrimp it is yeah. one of my favorite shrimp from the very get go but i do love yellow king kongs because sometimes you get some fun things to work with and they're always fun to throw in with other breeding projects for caradina to me i hate and it. they do muck up a lot of lines they muck them up yes. they turn everything orange or yellow <laughs> i did answer a it question so earlier long. someone said that they have orange and yellow neos in the same tank and they asked which one would be dominant and i said yellow because most likely yellow outbreeds the orange and usually orange or, coals look yellow or they cross and you get wilds and then they win the game and you didn't even know yeah. a player was on the field from the beginning that would take over and win yeah if you just keep calling though you could get them to It'd be really cool if someone gets an orange really, though, with a yellow center instead of a clear center. That'd that, be cool. the, if you are or worried opposite, about keeping orange. shrimp together and crossbreeding and getting wilds and thinking like that's 100% going to happen, that is how people make new types of shrimp. But if you cross them once and you get wild, you always get wild. You need to find that breaker, not link in the genetic that is happening to where they're going to make the wilds. You need to make something happen that they cross and the color patterns add on to one another. It's rare, but it is pretty much how you get new lines of shrimp. Brandon said, I crossed dragon bloods with che hybrid cheetahs and got a dragon blood with the beginnings of a zebra pattern. Has this been done before? So... I don't know of anybody doing this. I do know of people who have crossed dragon bloods with like shadow pandas and other Taiwan bees and stuff like that. Um, I would be interesting in seeing a picture because as they're really, really young, you could have a shrimp that looks blue. 
if you go back and watch my last video on our last video on the rack that we just took down in the coal tank there is some little tiny blue shrimp running around kind of look like blue dragons but they got the white zebra stripes to them those shrimp will turn black as they age that is just a tie tie b which leads me to believe because you are now the second cross and the second person to say that those are the type of shrimp that pop out of it uh reuben from shrimp pimpin is the first one and basically that tells me that there's some type of ghost mutation with the Taiwan bees or some type of Tai Tai bee. So they have the double pigment genetics there to be a Tai Tai bee when they're crossed with a, another shrimp. And the, the hybrid cheetahs have it in there too because I'm getting some really nice, like I'm, I'm talking like weird color blue on these steels that I haven't seen from anything else uh, pop up. And uh, they definitely have like steel genes or something in there. They have the Tai Tai B uh, phenotype popping up. So I don't think they're dragon bloods that you made. They're going to be some like zebra pintos, basically. Man, we ask you one simple genetics question. <laughs> Ten minutes later, I've Listen, fallen asleep. People ask for it. That's what they want. <laughs> I'm asking. Kirk said, I use RO water and shrimp mineral GHKH plus, and I struggle with the pH of 6.5 and a KH of 2 and a GH of 4 with a TDS of 230. How do I raise these numbers without raising TDS? All right, Kurt, I can answer that question by asking you a question. What kind of substrate are you using? And... Then and how long are you mixing your minerals for before you add them into the water? I need the answer of both of those questions. And then I 80% believe I can tell you the exact reason why and how to answer your question. Oh, you're not helping me out here. I need to do a water break. Oh, I'm so sorry. I will just uh, ramble on for a couple no, seconds. No, you're good. I'm good now. <laughs> I'm good now. All right. So. Caradino, we talked about total dissolved solids. Now let's talk about GH. Basically, same as the Neocaradina, you need a baseline of at least four. I like five to six GH. I definitely like six GH when I'm working with, say, blue bolts or any Tai Tai B, blue steel, anything like that that's going to try and show the blue coloration to it. I find the higher the GH the nicer the blue is or the longer that the blue bolts will hold the blue before they get moody and change off to that white hand color. With uh, the 6GH, it's fine with any of the other Neo Caradina shrimp that we have. And then with the uh, GH being any higher than that, it's pretty much pointless. It's not needed. And when most of us are mixing minerals, why would you mix to a GH of 12 when you only need six? You're just basically using twice as many minerals for no reason. Um, so uh, there is people out there whose tap water will come out low enough that the GH is like maybe one, their KH is zero, and they think that they can you know, use minerals and get to the perfect GH and TDS for their Caradina shrimp. And it might be possible, possible, but I, I would really recommend using that, uh, you know, just a small RO unit or something like that to strip all of those minerals, all of that element content out of the water and starting over so you know exactly what's going into the water moving forward. And then um, always mix your minerals the night before. If you mix your minerals up and you have GH only minerals, salts, and you wait an hour and you check the TDS and you're at 150 and you just add it to the aquarium. Well, if you would have waited overnight, those TDS could drop around 20, 20 points or they could raise 20 points depending on how the water uh, is being mixed or how cold it is and stuff like that. So you definitely want to make sure those minerals have a thorough amount of time to go through and be completely dissolved into the water uh so waiting overnight is really like the best way to do it um you don't have to wait a full 24 hours 
Uh, you could possibly mix your water in the early morning and then use it for nighttime water changes. Um, but I would uh, give it a, a good 12 hours at least for the water minerals to mix up into the water. Uh, Root asks, where, what's the clash? The clash is uh, an event held in Morgantown, Pennsylvania. It is the Keystone Clash. Uh, and it's a bunch of vendors. There's a fish show. There's even like a little invertebrate and park park to it. Um, there is a uh, swap tables for non-vendors and uh, overall just good people uh, talking about fish and other things like that. So it, it's a big event in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're in Florida and we're traveling to it for our second year in a row. Um, so it's definitely worth it in our books to look it up and check it out. Yeah. Stephen P said, that's why the fish fam link badges are so useful for people with their logo and, uh, being able to know who, who's who, cause you got your badge on. So yes, I always forget about those. <laughs> yeah. But I was I just thinking, them. but will we bring them? <laughs> I'm terrible, terrible. Uh, and even Dina mentioned it. She also does have one, at least one uh, macro algae for us, which I'm super excited. It's the feather one that's got the, it's really pretty. You know what I would like, Matt? If you could email me, I think you make like a little plaque or like a little stand up thing with the Fish Fam link thing. I think have I have room enough room at the Keystone <laughs> Clash that we might be able to put that up. So um, email me. I'll pay for it. All right. You don't have to send it free. I'll, I'll, I'll send you my monies, all the monies. Oh, welcome in. Anthony says, hey, Grant and Shelby, hope you're all doing good. My five cherries are still alive, doing good, but lost all my black roses. Besides cherries, what's the next best, easiest Neo to get? Poor black roses. Honestly, they're all going to be easy, especially if you're buying our livestock. So if you got our black rose yeah, and our red cherries and mm -hmm. something happened in the black rose tank, I would look into it. Um, I think they were all together. Yeah. Are they all in the same tank with one another? If so, then um, I, I, I don't really know what the answer because they, they should be just as hardy. If anything, our black rose are outbreeding our red cherries in every pond. Every We have to have 12 red cherry ponds to keep up. Uh, with the demand and we only really use one black rose pond to sell out of because it produces so many shrimp yeah, um true. but like if i had to tell you like the easiest one and the one i think is gonna be maybe the hardiest i would say i put money on yellow yeah. uh, i put all my chips on yellow if they were all to have a battle <laughs> in the hunger games my money's on yellow for the neo caradina at least at our house Aww. everybody else is gonna have different lines I would definitely put the least amount of chips on orange. Yeah. And that's just that's Lady just Diane Shiners died today. They were fine yesterday. That's so strange. Uh, it's always a it's always a question with fish sometimes. There was so many though in that river. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'd be down to go and grab those. Also, the next time we go up that way, we will have several racks for natives and collecting and stuff like that. So uh, Mark wants to know when he's going to get a shrimp named after him. I guess you have to get an ice cream named after you first. Like, when are you going to get that happen first? Uh, Touche. Why do I keep drinking? Ooh, so excited. Gina's got the ceramic media for the Pico tank and seating in the sump at work. And also got a bunch of really nice soft corals. I'm super excited. I have no idea. I've... Love saltwater. I'm just not very efficient with it um, because I'm lazy. Honestly, that is a hundred percent. One of these days so, I will do it, but I'm going to start with a macro algae tank. I think I'll I'll be good at that, and then lead into saltwater. While we're on topic, mm -hmm. uh, Harley actually makes these little inserts for the aquariums that have mm -hmm. little pre-scape designs, and I think he's going to send us some of those for them as well. Oh. They work for fresh and salt water, too. So if somebody doesn't want to buy even one of our aquascapes, I could be like, well, you can buy that. It's cheaper. It doesn't look as good, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, passing when you're in Florida, are you going to come to the uh, Aquashella? That'd be cool. Um, cage? Is it time for Cage? 
Yeah. Cage is the big one, guys. Yeah. It's the big one. Um. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Yes. You can you can go on. Oh, page. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. like, who no. are you talking to? You, you gotta click on it. You can't just answer people's questions like <laughs> yes. that. I don't no. know who you're yes. talking to. No. That, that works. You just like <laughs> as they come. Um so KH is going to be the most important factor when you are mixing up your water chemistry for caradina shrimp. In my opinion, there's no way around it. You absolutely have to have zero KH when working with caradina. There are, there's, there's few people out there. Um, and I'm sorry, when working with B type caradina, because the, of course the, the tiger shrimp and some of the hybrids and stuff like that, they can take some of the neo caradina parameters. But when we're talking like a true caradina tank, we're talking about crystal shrimp, Taiwan bees, Thai bees, Thai Thai bees, the pintos, the, uh, the nanashi and stuff like that. These guys have the double pigment. They have the bee genetics. They are going to need the lowest pH possible. And the only way to achieve that is with the zero KH. There might be other ways to achieve it. Again, not a chemist. And I don't know anybody else out there that it's like, oh, you can do it like this. And as far as I know, in my almost 10 years now of shrimp keeping, there hasn't been any other method out there presented besides having zero kh in your water now you might be able to get re get away with half a kh or one kh and stuff like that but that is going to be raising your ph ever so slightly and because of that you are going to have a shorter life cycle on your substrate or a higher ph will cause a lower baby survival rate at some point so you might not have effect at six months of your substrate at one kh but at a year into your 1K substrate, your pH might not be able to hold up into 6.2 or 6.3. And at that point, your baby survival rate will start to go down ever so slightly until 6.5 and might go away altogether. So having that zero KH isn't just needed for the low pH, but it is also essential for keeping your the keeping your, oh man, I'm still gonna fumble this. <laughs> I want to say live straight and it's aqua substrate or um, I'm, I'm trying to say like live sand for the salt water and it's not live sand, but it is aqua soil. Uh, this is a volcanic ash that is rolled up into little tiny balls and refined uh, with humic properties or humic properties um, that will help keep the, the pH at a nice and stable low six maybe even 5.5 or lower um, but anything over 6.5 is basically not going to work for caradina so i know i'm talking about cage and ph at the same time but the two of them are basically playing hand in hand with one another whether you're doing neo caradina or caradina and with caradina you really want it as low as humanly possible and with ro units you can get that down to zero uh, I know there's somebody out there that has a TDS of like a thousand. Well, yeah, you might need one five stage RO unit linked up with another five stage RO unit with a DI station at the end or something like that, that can really strip out those last fine minute particles to get your cage down to zero. Now with pH, I, I talked about the substrate and getting it as low as possible. Um, but with Caradina shrimp, and I'm not talking tigers, but for the majority, you want the pH under 6.4. When it creeps over to 6.4, especially 6.5, I either swap the tank over for tiger shrimp altogether. A lot of our Aurora tigers, our orange eye blue tigers, they do really well in some of our old school uh, shrimp king and SL aqua tanks where they're just not buffering into the low sixes anymore. Uh, where our bright well uh, in our old ADA soil uh, lasted well into five years and is still kicking and we are not having to swap it out uh, and replace the substrate or change it over for a tiger tank. So um, with having the zero KH, we really maximize the longevity of our soils and it's keeping the pH 
as low as possible, and the pH is being stabilized by the aqua soil. Without the aqua soil, the pH would be going up when the lights come on, and it would drop when the lights go off every day. And that fluctuation in pH, you can, it can climb as high as 7.6, and a 7.6 is definitely not good for babies to be molting. So even if it drops back down to 6 in the morning, that's, that's too high of a gap range, and that is definitely going to bring your baby survival down to almost nothing, if not nothing. Um, so keeping your pH as low as possible, watching it. Uh, we generally don't check the pH in our tanks, except for the first month. We'll cycle our aquariums. We'll check the parameters after 30 days, make sure the pH is still low, and just to check and make sure that the substrate hasn't been exhausted with one single water change that we might do before um, we start the tank. Kirk uh, said that he has fluval stratum um, and probably around 12 hours of mixing. He's the one who said he had a 6.5 pH and he needed to raise the numbers without raising the TDS. The fluval stratum is why your pH is dropping down to your 6.5. Uh, and it is also stripping out some of the GH and KH out of your water parameters. Um, your, your fluval stratum isn't actually needed uh, for the caridina shrimp. I know it's sold, or for the neocaridina shrimp. I know it's sold in the shrimp aisle at fluval. And it's convenient and it says shrimp soil on it and it makes it sound like all shrimp tanks have to have that substrate but they really don't but don't worry you didn't waste your time don't panic you didn't have to get that substrate but again if you like plants and you want good growth of your plants having that fluval stratum is definitely going to be better off for you um and to kind of combat that um the pH from dropping, you can add a little bit of baking soda into your tank and it is only going to strip out those minerals for so long, but also 12 hours of mixing, maybe not, might not be long enough. Uh, so just double check that you're getting your parameters high enough before you add them into your tank. And also for Neocaridina, uh, you, you can just, you know, add, add, or, I mean, I'm not sorry. If the tank isn't already cycled, you can add, you know, a spoon or a scoop of minerals directly into the tank without doing a water change to try and get those levels up because the fluval stratum is what's dropping the uh, pH. But if you keep adding a little bit more minerals and you bump that pH up just a little bit higher, your pH is going to neutralize up to like a 7.2 or 7.4. So Mimic Nature says... I don't have lids on most of my tanks. If you top off regularly, regularly and do proper water changes every week or so, is there still a risk of dangerous parameter fluctuations? Only if you're not topping off with... I lost train of thought. As long as you're not topping <laughs> off with tap water, tap water. then <laughs> you shouldn't have any, any issues. Um, we have plenty of aquariums in the house that don't have lids because they're aquascaped and there's stuff. Come don't click off of this guy until I tell you. I won't. Too, all right. <laughs> or girl. I, I don't know. Honestly, I'm sorry. But um, now I got off track. Um, the, the, the aquascape tanks, we don't even top them off. Basically, when it gets time for them to have their water changes, they might have an inch of water that's dropped and I just take out the water and I replace it with a proper water. I know the TDS is gonna climb ever so often, but in those aquascape tanks, every now and then we do like an 80 or 90% water change. And as long as your water parameters match up with the water going in the aquarium as the water that's already in the aquarium, then you can do like a 99% water change and it shouldn't do that much stress on the shrimp. Uh, you just wanna go slow, make sure you don't mess with the substrate or anything like that. But congratulations, Mimic. I don't have my phone pulled up or even on me. Um, but you did have the question of the two weeks. I don't know how to how to or comment of the past two weeks. So I don't know how to like come up with like a catchy name or segment. Um, but for those that don't know, every two weeks we have a Crypt Keeper question of the week. 
And in between those two weeks uh, where we don't have Crip come up with us, I like to pick out out of the past two weeks the best comment that has been left on any of our videos. So you can feel free to leave as many comments as you possibly want. I don't think there's somebody that's left more comments recently than Mimic. But his recent comment was he reached the end of watching all of our live streams <laughs> from our newest live. Well, you haven't watched all of this one yet because I haven't done it, all right? Um, but he's watched them all, all the way to the very beginning. And they have watched it all the way to the very beginning and commented that they are going to go back and re-watch the ones that are meaningful to them that pertain to the projects I commented back and said, hey, you know, let me know if you would recommend uh, any of the ones that, you know, would be worthwhile going back and diving into. And they said the genetics. So when I went off on a tangent earlier about the genetics, it's kind of for you. I wanted to dive in, get it in just for you. Um, but I also I saw you in chat earlier and you have one with that comment. So uh, send us an email now. You've watched enough of our live streams. You probably know what Sam scale prints that we have to offer. Uh, give me two of them. I think we've run out of blue dreams or blue, blues. blue, blue, blue bolts. Dreams. They're blue no. bolts. A blue bolt. I, I think, think we don't have any blues, but the tiger. Oh, we have my, I have orange eye, blue tigers, red cherries. And then you, you're supposed to guess the last one. Oh, if I'm you sorry. wanted it, I guess I ruined <laughs> it. All right. But yeah, just email us email address and we'll get back to you. And for everyone else, sorry, Matt, you lost your second favorite that last week or two weeks ago. I don't even have you on the ratings this week, so you oh, really good. need to step in. I like your, that comment. Oh, good. Anyway. I'm not the only one that kills Grand Strip. <laughs> Somebody else. Yeah. It's Anthony struggling. It, but he's very successful us, with we'll the other out. shrimp. Doing okay. Um, but I also remember that um, – I can't remember his name. I remember the icon. You bring bring up bring him up. Did you that had the issues? Solve this. Yes. Can yes. Okay. Yes. Um. Uh. But whoever had the issues with the black rose shrimp, I do remember they got the aquariums right. Yes. The uh, if the black rose went into the smaller aquarium, no, it went into a ten gallon. I'll talk to you about oh, okay. it. Okay. I'll have them. Um, message us and then we'll figure out what's what's causing the issue because they got lethargic and started to just get picked off so and I, alert alert aqua char is back on the website right did you put yes. it back yes it's in stock mm -hmm. we got it back um so if it is a tank possibly near like a bathroom or somewhere that you you might freshen up or have cleaning supplies near or something like that it's possibly contaminant contaminant in there or something on your hands might have gotten into that tank add a little aqua char in that and uh you know be worry free moving forward so it's the smallest things that could affect the tank really fast um we do a lot of things as humans with i mean as simple as cleaning something and you, you might have like a natural detergent but it still has a lot of alcohol or chemicals in it um, and then you touch your tank a little bit later because you just saw like one little thing in it and it could wipe out shrimp really quick because they're they're smaller. So it's not like a huge fish that can kind of handle uh, a little bit more. Um, but now shrimp are really hardy. I'm not saying that it's just with certain things they're smaller. So it affects them more. But um, Easy V Rider said, how do you adjust the GH to six for the blue bolt? And are you keeping the... 150 TDS while adjusting the GH. All right. So this is the kind of part that can be frustrating and you just kind of got to like uh, accept the fact that all test kits can be off 20 to 40% in accuracy. It doesn't matter if you get the best API uh, or Sira or whatever master kits out there. There can be individual... Uh, tests inside that kit that are going to be off in readings. They all do their best to be as accurate as possible, but you have to assume that there can be readings that are off one way or another. 
Um, there is ways to get even more precise and dialed down. If you wanted to get five and a half GH, how could you test for that? Well, instead of testing for five milliliters, you do 10 milliliters and you shake and every drop would be half a GH. Um, but with TDS pens not being calibrated every day, they can fluctuate 10 TDS in one direction or 20 or so at 150. It, it can fluctuate more than that. But um, the other thing is the GH uh, test kits. I've seen where salty shrimp, depending on where they live or, um, you know, the test kit that they got and stuff like that, I've seen salty shrimp add on for every total dissolve or for every gh it climbs 20 to 30 total dissolved solids for us we get that perfect ratio of 30 tds for one gh but i do find that at 150 tds we'll get 5 gh but at 160 tds we get 6 gh so i don't think it's a perfect 30 tds uh, to one GH, it's around there. It's ballpark there, but it is you know rounded up with that you know five milliliters that we shake up, and that ten TDS is enough to get it to jump up in line. So uh, you want to assume that your test kits are going to be off a little bit, but as long as you have five or six, a test kit that reads five or six GH, you're going to have enough mineral content in there. For them the mole it's definitely going to be higher than four um so you know this is why maybe getting two different test kits might be a little advantage and stuff like that but then the other thing is these results are going to vary from if you use salty shrimp or one of the different brands of gh only mineral content out there also does your ro water come out at absolute zero tds or does it come out at eight tds is your kh one out or one gh out of the ta or out of the ro uh, all of those can be a little minute factors also you might not have one gh out of the tap but you might have 0.25 or out of the ro am i boring you with this sometimes when you talk too long i think i think that's why you, we lost 15 you put people. some people we asleep. lost them <laughs> i just i just think you this know is the water um, chemistry it was a boring topic but like <laughs> Honestly, no, a lot of people t great. think that keeping fish and, and keeping shrimp, you're really just keeping water. I've heard a lot of uh, different breeders and keepers out there say, no, I'm, you're keeping water. And if you can keep the water <laughs> clean and right, true. then the inhabitants in the water will be doing all right. So, so um, Alberto was saying, asking again about the 75 plus house tents by keeping Caradina. Uh, I think you already answered that correctly. If I did didn't answer it, let's talk about it now because it is the next parameter ah, on the chart. We you just talked about cage. <laughs> now, the the temperatures. I do not like to see the temperatures climb above 75 in our house. Um, the only reason why I'm going off of this, well, there's two reasons really, is one, every single year there would be this guy in California who had spent a lot of money in the winter time on buying shrimp because the temperatures he could keep in his house at a, a stable enough rate. But in the summertime, he refused to buy a window unit for his house or to AC his house whatsoever. And the temperatures would climb. And every year he would make a post and complain about how his shrimp were dying. Now, there are people out there in Europe who are keeping Caradina shrimp in 80 degrees all year round. The problem is, is they don't live in California up in the mountains where the temperatures are drastically changing and dropping 20 degrees in their house and the parameters are fluctuating in the tanks, you know, 10 to 15 degrees. Um, so you, you really want to make sure you're keeping the, the temperatures as stable as you possibly can. Uh, if your house temp and you keep your house at 76 you're pretty much not going to have a problem. Just you want to avoid mixing up the substrate and anything like that that could possibly cause a bacterial infection. Definitely don't want to add new shrimp into your tanks because 
they're going to have weaker immune systems basically in warmer water the colder water is just going to help keep everything uh nice and don't don't change it yet uh ni nice and consistent in in your shrimp tanks um their immune systems are just going to do a lot better um but if uh you're having an issue keeping your temperatures in your aquariums below 75 oh the second the second reason was when we had irma our power knocked out for 21 hours and our our uh, temperatures in the house went from 70 to 86 degrees and we had issues in five of our tanks where they developed bacterial infections the only thing that really was the difference was the uh, temperature and once i started taking the readings of the temperatures inside the house while there was daylight and i could see inside the tanks at 76 was when i started to see issues in three out of the five aquariums so that's why i like to keep them under 75 or 72 as low as possible now ideas for keeping the temperatures down in your aquariums keep them as low as possible if you have your tanks in the ceiling and they're up high heat rises the higher up you have your aquariums the warmer they're going to be uh the second thing is is you can freeze ro water uh in the freezer make little ro water ice cubes and throughout the day drop a little ice cube as you check the readings this is obviously going to be a lot more work a lot more frustrating and stuff like that but it is one cost efficient way to keep the temperatures a little bit lower in your aquariums um the other way is to just take the lid off your aquarium and run a fan over the tank the fan is going to create ripples on the aquarium this is going to create faster evaporation and the evaporation itself is actually going to cause the temperature to drop. It's just a uh, chemical reaction that happens when the oxygen, uh, not oxygen, the water changes from uh, liquid to gas. Um, the other thing, uh, obvious uh, window AC unit. This can be expensive around like $130 to $500, depending on the unit size of your room, etc. And then, of course, the long-term expense of it, uh, raising your AC bill every month. But uh, when we're talking caradina shrimp, the good thing about caradina shrimp is that even though there is a high up, uh, high initial cost for keeping them, uh, they do, you know, have that higher price tag where when you do come time to sell them, it is easier to recuperate some of those costs and, and do it a little bit quicker. Yeah, anything else for him? These vibes came in with the dollar nine 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 super chat says thanks for the advice. Questions? Yes, no. <laughs> thanks so much, vibes. And I believe there's another super chat. I can't find it. Another dollar ninety nine super chat about the cup. And yes, it is a vibes cut. Got it. On here, I can't really hold this. It's full of water. I'm gonna drop it. <laughs> Thank you so much, vibes. All right, now we talked about how hot the caradina should or not get. Let's talk about how cold. Now, personally, I've never had the guts to drop caradina down outside uh, and see how low of a temperature they can really get. Uh, we had them in the garage last year where the temperatures in the garage did get down in the 60s and the tangerine tigers were just fine. Uh, there are people who keep them in their basements uh, around here and the basement temperatures do drop into the 60s. They don't use any heaters and their caradina shrimp are just fine. The only thing that I have not heard of is temperatures dropping below 60 in anyone's caradina, in, in anyone's caradina tank. So um, I, I haven't heard of somebody having a, a blizzard or anything like that that took off power and their caradina tanks got too cold or something like that and their tanks crashed um i'm not saying it hasn't happened i'm just saying i've never heard of it so i don't know how low the caradina shrimp can go if they are like the neo caradinas where they can keep all the way down in the 30s and not have any issues i'm just not risking it i i don't know uh that i have the uh, ability to get the water temperatures that low in the first place let alone do i want to i mean i'm sure i could freeze water bottles and keep a tank really low for a long time but it's just like torturing shrimp for no reason most people's house 
at room temperature is good enough for almost all shrimp except for Sulu SA. They are the only ones that need the temperature at 80 degrees, 84 degrees even is all right. Uh, but they need those higher temperatures in order to survive. So Abstract says, does your gecko watch the fish in your tanks or all the geckos? So the geckos actually are up above and really don't get to see anyone. It's, they're so high. But I did put one in a glass aquarium next to our black rose tank. And it was watching it like a hawk. They like look like they wanted to eat the shrimp. So I'm like kind of curious if there was like shrimp on the surface, if it could snipe them real quick. You never know what I, I doubt they would ever. The other thing is though, geckos are nocturnal. So they're usually up and walking around when the lights are off. There's very uh, few hours in the day where that overlaps. So um, Anthony <coughs> talking about your tank real quick. Um, so they have a split tank and you have a waterfall with the fish and then the shrimp and it's split and it flows through all of it. The only thing I could think of is if you got those fish from a pet store, they could also, um, cause some issues for the tank because we've had fish that were imported and can cause issues for shrimp. They don't necessarily have the same, um, diseases immune system. and basically but, i like to call it smallpox if you know anything about uh the european settlement in what's going on everything okay yeah there's just weird lights across the street it doesn't look like no, a right, we're fine oh it's a ufo everyone that's no. it's aliens all right it's now i don't know what we we're talking about uh, oh, so his, his speaker, tank yeah. smallpox um, basically, European settlers came over where smallpox, I'm sure, was killing people, but a lot of the people had immune system to where it wasn't wiping out entire uh, colonies and stuff like that. But when they came over to America, the natives, they didn't have any immunity for smallpox, and it completely wiped out entire tribes or like 80 to 90 percent before uh, they were able to build up an immunity and, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if they were able to come up with a cure or anything like that or what happened in the final end product of that. But that's what I like to refer is when you bring in something that's from a pet store and it's mainly live critters, it could be snails, it could be fish, or it could be other shrimp. You add them into the aquarium and they've got some type of pathogen on them that's able to be transmitted through the water column and the shrimp have no immunity to it that the fish had immunity the fish could be perfectly fine no problems at all but um it, this is you know not really a problem that you have to have or deal with with home breeders and stuff um it's more of a problem with fish stores because those pathogens are rare, few and far between in the first point. But with pet stores, they have such a regular, you know, uh, flow of new inventory coming and going that the possibility of them being, and not only that is some pet stores will keep them in individual systems, but most of them are all connected with one another. So if one tank has it, chances are they all have it. And, uh, they have any dead ones they get rid of those quickly so the ones that are there and they are living they just have that immunity already built up to where your shrimp might not have that so um this is also a possibility with reptiles or birds or anything that you're keeping um but to answer your question a little bit better each one of these tanks are individually run no water is like so the water parameters are the same for a lot of them but like our bottom row has um, neo tanks but they are not connected. They are run from their own individual sponge filter. And the reason for that, and even if we were to run a pet store, is a big reason for fish having different diseases. You could have shrimp, like we don't, because we don't import. So it's not like a big issue, but say one, one does get sick and one does have a problem from like a plant we brought in, or it's got plenary, you don't wanna ever touch that tank to the next tank. So you always wanna make sure that you don't give it all the same water. It just makes it for a better health purposes in the long run. All right. Now, with that being said, I will give away 
in two weeks a free Sam Scales print to whoever can answer me first. First person only. I'm not going to let Matt get away with like commenting the same thing that <laughs> I don't know who's going to get it right, right? But anyways, whoever can tell me why we keep our Caradina tanks above our Neo Caradina tanks will win in two weeks. Um, I might have said that in the past. So if someone was paying attention, Mimic, you might be able to win this one again. Um, but it's confusing when you think about the temperatures and the Neo Caradina would be better up top. But why do I not keep them up top? Let me find out. Let's see if anybody can figure it out. It's the biggest joke. Um, sorry. And another thing, Anthony, I'm so sorry. Um, you were talking about getting a bio substrate for your Neos. You do not need that. Most of our Neo tanks, we either have, oh, did I respond to that already? I think I did message I don't feel, it. I don't feel no, like I messaged it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but anyways, to reiterate, um, especially if anyone's having issues, you don't really want a lower pH for Neo Caradina. I highly suggest you always have something inert um, or even higher to me. They need more minerals than Caradina for some reason. They come in different. They need those minerals to be able to shed. I, I shed molt properly. I believe they've done better in like a neutral pH um, than a lower one. Now there are people that have had some success with it. Well, they breed them in like Asia and yeah. lower pH. But the water like just comes out better. lower. I would just go with whatever you can consistently give to your shrimp the easiest possible way for Neo Caradina. Yeah, but I for Caradina shrimp, it has to have the, the yeah. right parameters. With Neo Caradina, it should be whatever is the easiest for you to prep and keep stable and consistent. Oh, Gina's got a good thing. So also be aware of uh, TSD drift with RODI systems. TDS will settle in the membrane if the system isn't being used often. So it's recommended to flush your RODI lines for 10 minutes before using. I didn't know that because ours is constantly running. <laughs> Never had to sit. So, and then Zen said, can you use water bottles and refreeze them like ice blocks that don't actually melt into your tank? Yeah, no, you, you absolutely can use the uh, RO water bottles. Uh, we, we like to use that um, to cool off our uh, RO water buckets that we use the trash cans for all of our uh, water changes. If I need water and I pull it out of the RO storage container. It's kept in the garage where the, the temperatures are uh, up in the 80s. So I do like to throw a water bottle in there to kind of bring it back down to 74 or 72 before I do my water changes. And I also like to think if it's at 74 and it's going through the air, it likes to cool off a little bit before it hits the water. And it's just a, such a minute amount. It's probably cooling off or not raising the tank up a, even a full degree during the water changes. Thank you so much, Mimic Nature says, thank you so much. You're such an asset to the hobby. I'm male, by the way, so you know what pronouns you use. <laughs> I look forward to more genetic videos. <laughs> I'm sorry that in the same sentence is just funny to me. <laughs> thank you so much for the $5 super chat. I had a feeling. Glad I got it right. <laughs> uh, and then, um, so, but... Well, let me just finish tonight's train of topic, and then we can answer all the questions. Um, but basically, if we're going to talk about the final parameters for caridina, the last ones, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, the nitrogen cycle is going to be the exact same as the neocaridina. You want these levels as zero, close to zero, as humanly possible, and that's super easy to do as long as you have a well-cycled tank. I wanted to talk about real quickly how we cycle our aquariums for Neo Caridina and Caridina. Our method is basically exactly the same substrate, and then we add in our water. Mix up the water is obviously different depending on what kind of shrimp we're doing, but we add in a little bit of Bacter, uh, bake, I'm sorry, Florin Bacter 7, which is the shrimp uh, bacteria from. Brightwell. It's got seven different bacteria in there. The idea behind that is, you know, two or three, if not all seven 
of those bacteria will colonize and do work and you will get maximum efficiency out of your colonies of bacteria inside your aquarium. Some bacteria will be able to live where others won't and vice versa. So you wanna make sure that you get a good bacteria. Liquid bacteria is gonna work and start colonizing within three days where a powdered bacteria is going to take at least seven days just for it to awaken and act and start working because when it's dried up, it's basically put into a hibernation stasis. So uh, it takes like three days at least for, or seven days at least for it to wake up and start colonizing. Um, there's several different bacteria out there. We've tried a bunch of them. Another one of my all time favorites is the Proteo Bio. Uh, that's a great one. Comes in a little tiny tube. You break off both sides, you pour it into the aquarium. And then I like to just toss the little tube in there too, because there's a bunch of bacteria that kind of colonizes on the inside of the glass and lives and does this thing. We still so. have tubes in our tanks from yeah. like seven years ago. <laughs> it's in and the little garage souvenirs now. at this point. It's you know? in there. It's crazy. So, uh, with that being said, keeping your oh, keeping that alive during the 30 day cycle, we just add in a little tiny bit of. Uh, fertilizer really doesn't matter what kind of fertilizer you use. We use a Florin Bacter. It's another Brightwell product, um, but you can use any type of fertilizer that doesn't have copper. Uh, don't overdo it. You just basically need to give a little bit of dirty water into uh, the water column that the, the bacteria can kind of colonize and eat. Um, I do not recommend doing ammonia. Every single person that has ever come to me with a ammonia issue where they cannot get their aquarium cycled and they use pure ammonia, they always do it wrong. I don't know anybody out there that is like adding in the right amount of ammonia and it's fully cycled and their aquarium is done within 30 days. Adding in pure ammonia is like almost a guaranteed way to make your cycle go on longer. And with shrimp, I don't care about really the ammonia or the nitrogen cycle or anything like that because the bio load is so low that I'm more worried about for 30 days. I want those biofilms to colonize and grow and make a good natural food source for the shrimp to be able to live and survive in. Um, so for cycling our aquariums, 30 days, a little bit of bacteria, a little bit of fertilizer, don't rush it. And then that way your, your tank is set up proper. I don't even follow the ammonia into nitrites, into nitrates. I don't watch those or maintain those. After 30 days, Shelby checks the ammonia. If the ammonia is reading zero, we send it. If the pH is right, at least. But that's because we, check those we know only our two water. Things. If and there is a different water source, then we would have to check it. Say we did it different, like salt water or something we're mixing, we, we would want to check it. But we know if we mix it to this parameters with our water, we want to, we know what we're doing. Tap water once in a blue moon. If there's an issue ever, um, I will check some That's of the if parameters. TDS fluctuates, but yeah. we check TDS before we do our tap water water changes. Um, and then the other thing, uh, never mind. I can't remember what the other thing was. Space. <laughs> oh, that was good. Okay. Shady Grady said the parameters in my fancy red tiger tank are all in spec and i recently raised the tds from 150 to 160 to help hatching i am seeing buried females but no babies what else can i try all right i'm sorry i'm gonna have to reread this you're gonna have to tell uh, remind me later the thing that i remember or forgot i remembered it's how we mix our total dissolved solids uh water for our caradina i mix it up to 150 and because we use the same minerals and very low RO water every single time, I know that when our TDS is mixed to 150 or 160, that we have exactly 5 to 6 GH and 0 KH. And I don't have to test the, the GH, the KH, and I don't ever worry about the pH of the RO water because depending on how much gases are in the uh, uh, RO water, and then what the actual pH of the tap water is will affect your RO water's pH. So once the water hits your tank, the pH will take over from there based on what substrate you have or KH in the water. All right. 
You want to say anything to that while I read uh, the parameters in my fancy red tiger tank are all in spec. And I recently raised the TDS from 150 to 150 to help with hatching. I'm seeing buried females, but no babies. What else can I try? Um, so basically, if you're getting buried females, you're you're probably not doing anything wrong. Um, just stay steady. Make sure you're doing your water changes um and give them time yeah give them time so females uh sh female shrimp first time moms are notorious for just either dropping their clutch or absorbing it before it's even done uh they might get stressed out and like tired of holding on to them because it's a new muscle they've got their little swimmerettes and they're fluffing the muffins all day and just trying to keep the eggs fresh and not getting any fungus and that can be tiring for a first time mom so what happens is she molts too soon or something happens and the eggs just don't get to full maturity in time to hatch. Um, they're also eggs. They're delicious. The shrimp love to eat them. They eat them quickly um, before you even get a chance to see them most of the time. So you could see a molt in the tank and the eggs were eaten out before you even knew it was a molt that had eggs attached to it. They could do it at nighttime when you turn the lights off and you never even knew it happened. Also, the other thing is... Don't know how great your eyesight is and stuff like that. But I generally tell people after a female is pregnant, don't even worry about, unless you really like playing I Spy or Where's Waldo, don't worry about looking for babies or seeing any babies for like the first two weeks. Because if she is a good first time mom and she was able to hold on or it's her second time around and she's a good mom, she's going to find like that perfect place that's not getting a lot of foot traffic, that's not getting a lot of disturbance that the babies can be released in, grow up, be safe from predators, not have any other competition with the adults and other shrimp, and plenty of little bioorganisms and food for them to survive off of and grow to a size where they can molt and then feel comfortable walking around and then actually make their way out to the food pile themselves. We gotta make a shirt say fluffing their muffins with a very <laughs> female. With a bunch of Sorry. muffins instead of a... <laughs> I like it. Uh, but and then um, your question earlier, when you said that person would get the winning, and it, they've already been answering. Um, and I don't know how how spot on you want the answer or the, the answer to be because these two I need, answered at the same time. I am looking for a specific answer. Oh, they you are beating around there. the bush, well, some of you. And not only that, but but I I'm basically looking for one basic run of the mill answer. You're kind of beating around the bush, but it's got to be a comment in the other posts. It can't be in tonight's live chat. So even if you had the right answer tonight, it's not right. You gotta wait till after and comment or comment on one of the other videos uh, that we've had in the past. Thank you so much, Matt, for the two dollars super chat question. Why do you keep your neo takes on the bottom? You're gonna have to wait was... for two weeks to find the answer. <laughs> he paid two dollars. <laughs> I told him when the answer where to find the answer. That was a good one. That was a good one. It took me a minute to get that one, honestly. What if I told the right answer and you still didn't type it in fast enough? Like that would that, that would, would be a bummer. Worse. Like I, I I feel like when you brought that up, five people like jumped to a comment on like another video really quickly to like type it out. A lot of you are on point to me, so I don't Not know today, how Matt. how close you're wanting this, but yeah, just comment on the actual video instead of live chat. Yes. Um. Yeah. So I mean. I don't, I don't read the live chat, so it's got to be somewhere where I can read it. <laughs> I, I didn't get, and, and Matt, I didn't read last week's live chat, but don't worry. I got the cliff notes from Crypt Keeper. <laughs> We're good. Um, doo -doo -doo. Should, I, should I talk about last week yeah, or I this week? Yeah, I got to read all this. So. All right. Uh, so this week we had Mo Devlin, who I consider to be one of the better aquarium photographers in the United States. Uh, I'm not going to say the best because I don't know them all, but I do know that there are a lot. Oh, Alan is here. So Alan, 
the shrimp are all doing very well. But um, uh, Moe's, uh, some of his pictures are, are really famous. They're on a lot of the different fish magazines and stuff like that. Um, and he's like just a super humble, really nice guy. When we were first getting into photography and using a DSLR body and stuff like that, uh, a lot of the people that we reached out to for help and stuff, they didn't want to show us any time of the day. Um, and these were people that I had gone out of my way to help them out a lot. So I thought the least they could do would be like a return a little bit of a favor. Um, where Mo, I had no conversation with Mo other than I had seen him talk for Tampa Bay Aquarium Society years ago. I kind of added him on Facebook as like, all right, this is the dude. I'm going to see his real nice photos and I'm going to kind of strive to be like him. Um, and then I kind of just was like, I really need help on like what, what kind of equipment to buy and get started with. And Mo was more than kind enough to, you know, answer my questions and really give back uh, all of his knowledge that he had. So are you sharing these live? Not yet. Not yet. So um mo really just above and beyond what i ever could expected to for to get any help um and i was able to give him uh not give him but uh, show him my respect at the triple crown uh where i got to see him again in person it was only the second time ever meeting the guy um and like he was like oh how did do and stuff like that and I, I kind of told him, I was like, oh, I, I, it's kind of just a lot easier for me to use my cell phone um, because by the time I get everything out, it's still really hard. I have to do a lot of work and the cell phone pictures, it, they just kind of work. And the guy's like, I got it. But like, we could we could step it up a level, right? And in two weeks, maybe even days later, maybe I'm, I'm saying within two weeks, um, he messaged me back with like five different things that I should try out to work on on my photography. And I was like, hey, I'm super busy. Or we like, I just, that was when Jaden's leak happened in his room. And I was like, I don't got time to think about photography right now, but I do have a responsibility with the Pasco Aquarium Society and we need speakers. So what month would you like to speak next year? Um, and this, this was the month he came out and spoke. Um, it was truly a dream come true having Mo Devlin come to the house and actually want to photography and take photos of our turtles, of our shrimp, some plants. Um, and then on top of that, um, asked us to bring out our camera and show us some tricks. Let me use his, or let us use his extension lenses. Let us use his lights. Um, we really got like the VIP hands-on treatment uh, where these are just Shelby's photos from one day of just listening to Mo and him helping us with camera settings and stuff like that. Um, they don't look that and, great. And it's them. not done here. We might have a, a very busy schedule in front of us, um, but when we get home from the Keystone Clash, I would like to like dedicate one day to photography where we go through and we try and take as many photos. Uh, even this photo right here is like, worthy of just being the photo of the day that we post on instagram or something like that it's a picture of our beautiful red king kong tank or red wines you do have some red dragon blood red king kong in the bottom right hand corner just barely sh popping its head out of the the gravel there um but uh you got a bunch of different varieties of red king kongs in this tank and uh this is a red galaxy pinto one of shelby's right Mm -hmm. Looking through yeah. them. Mm -hmm. uh, another red uh, galaxy no pinto. A little. Ooh, <laughs> there, there it is. is. Uh, automatically it, this is so red, it's black. This is a red shrimp. Um, and the, the red pigments are just overlapping one another that it's so dark, it, it's beyond red. <laughs> More of red uh, Shelby's galaxy pinto. That one didn't turn out. Like this is a great picture Sorry. of a orange-eyed red steel. Mm -hmm. um, if you have red lapis, they will throw a lot of these. This one came out of our red lapis tank. Yeah, that's it. The other ones uh, I haven't uploaded. They did pretty good, but there's some funny photos of us at the bottom people can see. So. <laughs> <laughs> if you saw that, 
don't don't be distracted by that. Um, there was a question. Sorry, did you finish your sentence? I don't know. Good. All right. <laughs> Do you think dart frogs and neos would work together? So you, you can answer. You can you answer. Like you, answer. You, you, you're just so, so much of an expert on this as I am. When when we bred tar frogs, it is one thing I do remember is that dart frogs will drown. So the one thing you can do, which we have uh, wanted to do for a long time, we just haven't found the time to, is you could do a split tank um, and drain into a bottom tank but you have to be able to block the dart frogs from getting in the water because you need enough water for the neos that the parameters aren't fluctuating too much um but the dart frogs can't be able to get into the water because they will drown i don't understand why they do but i think it has to do something with their um their skin they can't properly jump back out of the water being wet but here's what's misleading and here's the problem we just went to the Missouri Zoo. Guess what was at the Missouri Zoo? Dart frogs. Guess how much water was in the dart a frog lot. aquarium? A ton. So, but you know why those dart frogs are okay? Because they're full-grown adults. Yeah. If you have full-grown adults, they can kind of get around the water. They're having to go through water to get from one pond or one breeding spot to another. And they've kind of learned how to swim, if that makes sense. But baby, juvenile, half sub adults and stuff like that, they their their tendencies to drown is just so high. And also, I don't know how often the zoo is replacing their dart frogs. So I do not suggest keeping them in water if they're not absolutely full grown and you don't feel like Bigger replacing ones. them often. And it might be a certain species that can take deeper water. Yeah, but, but for most of them, they were. Unfortunately, not the brightest. But I, I have an idea for a dark frog neocaridina tank that Shelby was uh, referring to with the little split where you shouldn't be able to see the split. And uh, yeah, like someone had to break their leg and just totally forgot about that project altogether. We also broke the first tank of it. So oh, yeah, that, that, also that set was us back. That was just a little bit like deterring <laughs> when you set up everything right and then it cracks on you and you didn't do the crack. Like mm -hmm. I just put it down perfectly on a mat so it would all be perfect. Yeah. And then went to go carve it, started carving it, got halfway done and noticed it was cracked. So remind me after the stream, I have something to say. And I know I didn't too. crack it because the foam came out of it and hardened perfectly. So what mm -hmm. did you, what did I need to remind you of? I couldn't, uh, I couldn't the phone remember. When we're done. Oh, what so about it? Zen says, is the Brightwell stuff harder to overdose and start a bloom like the Baker AE? Not saying I've done it, asking for a friend. No, it, it's not like that at all. It doesn't have the same, uh, the, the Bacter AE is a biofilm builder where the bacteria, uh, the Florin Bacter 7 uh, those are actually liquid bacteria that are colonizing for your filter. The the Bacter AE doesn't have that, uh, I don't know, ability is not the right word, but that's what's coming to my head. Mimic said, I know you don't recommend B Bacter AE, but I have some. Is it still useful in establishing the biofilm in a new tank if you're still taking proper time to establish a new tank? So there, there's really nothing wrong with a Bacter AE. I just like found that we stopped using it and we still had really good baby survival rates and stuff like that. So I would honestly use it if you wanted to in new aquariums, no problem. I would even dose it uh, in small amounts when you do water changes just to get rid of it so it doesn't go to waste. But like I wouldn't spend my money on it um, it's one of those products where like we should probably have that on the website and sell it. But I really don't like to keep anything on the website that we don't use. Um, but it does have its uses if you wanted to rush an aquarium cycle and had to get it done in seven days because you had a tank crack or something like that. Like there are emergency situations where the Bacter AE could have its uses. And that's why I've been considering keeping it on the website. 
Easy V Rider said, what is the hardest shrimp to keep and or the shrimp that has been the hardest for you to keep? I've got one. What's your one? I know which one your one is. Do you though? Princess Bees. No. We've gotten those to breed just fine and keep no problems at all. Oh, okay. What's the one shrimp that we want more than all the others and we've never been able to keep them alive very long? Harlequin, Sulu essay. Oh. Yeah. Those, by far, for whatever reason, there's homebred Sulu essays of several other different varieties other than the Cardinals, uh, White Orchids, and Galaxies, and stuff like that. There isn't any homebred Harlequins in the United States. There are some in Europe and other countries um, where transport, transporting and stuff like that isn't a long trip across the pond. And uh, that long trip basically wipes out 50% of the population in the bag, if not more. And then you lose like 50% every single day for a week or two. And if you are lucky enough to stabilize it, um, generally we got one buried female and then never saw any babies and then just never saw any dead bodies, probably because the rabbit snails were eating them faster than uh, we could find a dead body. But um, I would say the Harlequin Sulu SA are going to be like, the hardest shrimp for us to keep alive even. And then Alan said that they're doing great and the shadows are really showing their blue. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I gave you kind of like a different mix of shadows. I, I probably shouldn't have done the trade for shadows, but I'm not going to say no to you, Alan. And uh, there wasn't a lot of the select from on the shadow panda uh, pattern, but I thought you might like some of the King Kongs, the one stripes and stuff that are also blue. Travis said, am I okay to set a tank up for the 30 day cycle if I have Samurai Soil, Florin Bacter 1 and Florin Multi-Step? For Neo Caridinas, yes, absolutely. If you're using the Samurai Soil though for Caridina shrimp, uh, the bees, uh, you could do it for Tiger shrimp, but uh, the Samurai Soil will not buffer your uh, substrate to uh, six pH or lower. Um, but if you go to our, how to set up a Neo Caradina tank, Samurai soil, floor and back to one floor and multi is the exact method that we use for that. And it says also I have bee shrimp minerals, but isn't that for when I add the shrimp? Um, so no, the, the bee shrimp minerals should be added for the RO water before they go into the tank. But if you're doing Neo Caradina shrimp and tap water, uh, you might not need the uh, shrimp minerals at all. Unless you're talking like the mineral balls and stuff like that, then yeah, I'd probably wait until like the day before you add the shrimp to put them suckers in. And then Easy View Rider says, so does that mean we will be getting some pictures for the shrimp on the website that says images coming soon? Yes, when oh, we get back and we're um, a little bit more settled. Actually, I think we might be able to work on some of the pictures on the website in the next couple of days before Animal Con. Since Maybe. Oh, you know, yeah, I'll be home. Yeah, Shelby's so. got the next two weeks off, so we'll be able to get caught up on projects and get everything ready for the Keystone Clash. We've got a huge order of plants, not our largest order yet, but like the second largest order of plants that we've ever gotten. On top of we've been regularly stocking plants and getting them ready for the Keystone Clash. So we pretty much have the largest uh, amount of plants that we've ever had. Uh, and it'll be here tomorrow. Um, yeah, these bins got to be filled. We got like, well, how many? 200 more? We're having some fun no, with those No, we bins. got 130 more. <laughs> it's like 200. But there, well, there's at least 150 that we haven't used before that. So there's probably 250 bins uh, that are up and running and... Uh, not up and running up and ready to be running oh i did skip one earlier brandon said any orange eyed white jeans that, that we have the closest would be like an orange eyed steel oh, well, we, but not the we, steel that we I have, have the actually. orange eyed blue steels in, in jaden's yeah. room that have the white to them mm -hmm. uh we also have uh their orange eyed red lapis have a good amount of white to them from time to time uh, the, the black lapis, I regret putting them up in that tank. It was too dirty. I hate dirty tanks for new shrimp. Mm -hmm. If I'm stocking a tank with like 50 shrimp, like we did the, 
Uh, we took all of the green tiger culls out of one aquarium and threw them into one of the dirty tanks on the old rack. And that, that I love doing, but just like 12 shrimp, I'm not doing those in dirty tanks no more. I, think this I like is, to see them. This is the funniest thing. So Brandon, I saw your comment earlier, but it, it autocorrect Casper to Caper. So it looked like an extreme caper. So um, I was looking up what caper was. It's a fish. No, it's, no, it it's is. a it's thing. It's a, um, it's a fish. Okay. Well, so what, what did you what did you look up? It's an ingredient. Like it's a, an additive mm -hmm. to food. But how's your extreme caspers doing? Can we see pics? Um, we we have them going up there in the top of the aquarium. I. I haven't taken any pics recently to show you any, and they're too high up there to get them on for you tonight, too late in the stream. But I'll try and take some this week and post them on Facebook if you follow me on there. Johnny said, which of your yellow eye Neos or Caradina are the hardiest for beginner? The yellow eye Neos, we don't have any of the yellow eye Neos. Um, the orange eye caradina shrimp and stuff like that, they're they're all caradina. The orange eyed yellow king kongs, the orange eyed blue tigers and stuff like that. Um, but the hardiest caradina I always tell everybody are the tangerine tigers. Yellow king kongs would be next in line or the raccoon stardust. Um, cheetahs are also very hardy. I would say the orange eyed yellow king kongs produce the most though. That's what they're asking. They're oh. looking for specific yellow eyes, which yeah, there just isn't any legit yellow-eyed Neos. Abstract just wants you to say this. What would you recommend as botanicals? I wouldn't use any of them. You gotta say it. I wouldn't use any botanicals. <laughs> I know that was like the worst I, I ever it. said it. That was you, great. That was great. It wasn't uh, as good as it usually is because it wasn't as smooth. Anytime you it use botanicals, forced. you really get... <laughs> You know, a lot of mulm breakdown in your aquarium and stuff like that. They got a lot of good properties uh, where they add in the tannins. The tannins can help with the immune system and stuff like that. But for the most part, I will not add any botanicals. The only ones tank. that I actually don't mind are going to be the um, Tapa leaves. Those are the ones that I don't find as annoying or terrible as the rest. Um, I've done catapa leaves in a lot of my tanks and they eventually wear, but like I've done palm trees, uh, pine needles, uh, different pods, and all of them, like the pods get gross and cause a lot of issues. And if you're using it for a shrimp tank, you just can't vacuum up that mold because there's a chance that you have babies in that because they do love it. Don't get me wrong. So if you don't like the look of mold, um, you know, what I can say that. just fine though. Hmm. Botanical gardens. You're still saying it weird. Still saying it weird. All right, yeah. never mind. <laughs> I thought I'd come out sooner. Botanical gardens. <laughs> Tried. <laughs> Sounded better in the head. Travis says, "So to keep crystal red shrimp, etc., what should I acquire?" I would find some Brightwell substrate, um, and then make sure that you're getting GH only minerals. Uh, for your uh, aquarium, and then make sure you're using an RO new unit with as low as TDS as possible. So TDS pen, RO unit, aqua soil, GH only minerals, sponge filter, aquarium, and then a source for water. A light, and that's everything you need, right? Did I forget anything? No. no I don't think um, but Travis... I would go and look at everything you need to do uh, or everything you need to know on to keep Caradina shrimp. Uh, we've got that posted in our videos beforehand. And then also we have how to breed crystal Caradina shrimp. It's going to tell you the exact same thing in both videos, basically. Mimic says, I know you all haven't fully tested stratum, but it's what I can get locally and I it's what all five of my new tanks are loaded with after two weeks, the pH turns yellow immediately seems to be working. That's not our issue. Um, so we did, ha we have fluval stratum and we've had it for quite some time. Um, the wait, pH. Yeah. the Yeah. It's okay. Sorry. I thought that was ammonia too. I'm more worried about ammonia 
um, that's a big thing to test because sometimes it doesn't uh, cycle fast enough or you'll have an ammonia spike um, well, prior to the 30 days. So just double check and keep checking on that ammonia. But after that, we're, we're talking about in the long run and how long that the fluval stratum works. That's why we don't recommend it just because we haven't had it for the full amount of time where it's run it, run its course where we have for quite well. His problem is, is it's not even two weeks old and it's already too high. Too high. Yellow is low pH. No, yellow is neutral. You're the one that tests the pH. Blue is, is low pH. No, you're wrong. No, I'm not. You can go get the test kit. Look it up right here. Okay. But maybe, maybe, but I'm pretty sure what he's talking about is his pH is already neutral, which I think is yellow, and low pH is blue. Low pH is yellow. Yellow. 6.0. Oh, okay. I'm wrong. Don't tell the person who tests all of the tanks what color it is. Yeah, so... <laughs> um, if it's blue, that's good. You want, you want your pH as low as possible, but like, yeah, Shelby mentioned, all right, that's why yeah. I got everything backwards. I'm only right um, once in a while. Yeah, so I'm going to gloat in this for just a we, second. We do water. have the, the fluval substrate set up for over a year now. And we do have orange eyed yellow King Kongs, galaxy pintos, crazy blues, uh, pure black line. A lot of these harder shrimp that uh, would, you know, desire the lower pH and the pH is still holding and those tanks are all just fine. So um, I know Fluval is something that you can get at the Petco and that's like why we wanted to test it because if somebody is having issues with it, chances are at this point they did something wrong cycling the tank or their water isn't exactly uh, zero KH going in. So, um, on this too, so abstract said don't pine needles leach sap. So the only pine needles that I actually get are like dried up ones on the ground. I would never take like fresh needles. Um, they probably could leach a little bit, but I don't put enough in. Um, every body of water that you find in Florida actually has pine needles in it. So it usually does pretty well for more of a biotope, which is what I had. I had um, fungulus chrysotis. Um, so I did put more natural botanicals in their tank because once I, when I'm converting them into aquarium lifes, it just seems more natural to keep them what, what they have. I mean, you'll find thousands of pine needles. So as long as you keep up on water changes, it wouldn't be like an issue with it. Um, but if you were to just pick it off the tree, yes, it would be a problem, but they're usually pretty dry and they're not, they don't even have that part that connects them to the tree. So, but, and then there was one thing. Nope. We're good. I think we caught up on chat for once. All right. Thank you everyone. Thank you uh, for those who joined as members or re up their membership. Thank you for the super chats the super stickers and everybody who contributed. And remember if you can guess why I keep the, Caradina tanks above the Neo Caradinas. I need an exact answer. And uh, I'm looking for one thing specific. And uh, that will be uh, the winner for the print. Congratulations, Mimic, on this week's. Uh, we'll see you next week with the Crypt Keeper topic of the week uh, or question of the week. And uh, until then, everyone have a good day. Thank you guys so much.